Good morning. On this second Sunday of Easter, we'll begin our service after the ringing of the bell, and then we have a baptism. Our Savior Jesus Christ commanded baptism when he said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All of us are born into this world with a deep need for baptism. From our parents we inherit a sinful nature. We are without true fear of God and true faith in God and are condemned to eternal death. But Jesus took away our sin by giving his life on the cross. At our baptism, he clothes us with the robe of his righteousness and gives us a new life. Our sinful nature need not control us any longer. We recall what baptism means for our daily lives as we speak these words together. Baptism means that the sinful nature in us should be drowned by daily sorrow and repentance and that all its evil deeds and desires be put to death. It also means that a new person should daily arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. As baptized children of God, we confess our sins. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. 
Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In obedience to the command of our Lord and trusting in his promise, you have brought this child to be baptized, along with witnesses who can vouch that the sacrament has taken place. Jesus told us, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. It is in baptism that God grants the new life of forgiveness, joy, and peace to little children. By the power of God's word, this gracious water of life washes away sin, delivers from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe. Receive the sign of the Holy Cross upon the head and upon the heart to mark you as a redeemed child of Christ. Levi, Louise, Bo, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has forgiven you all your sins by your baptism, you are born again and made a dear child of your Father in heaven. May God strengthen you to live in your baptismal grace all the days of your life. Peace be with you. Amen. Please stand. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our Lord commands that we teach his precious truths to all who are baptized. Christian love therefore urges all of us, especially parents and sponsors, to assist in whatever manner possible so that Levi may remain a child of God until death. If you are willing to carry out this responsibility, then answer, yes, as God gives me strength. We pray. Merciful Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessing of baptism by which you offer and grant the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. Help us to regard our baptism as the robe of righteousness we are to wear all the days of our life. Look with special favor on Levi and grant him a rich measure of your spirit that he may grow in faith and godly living. Make us willing to carry out our responsibilities to those who have been baptized so that all of us may finally come to the blessed joys of heaven through Jesus, our Lord. Okay. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. O risen Lord, you came to your disciples and took away their fears with your word of peace. Come to us also by your word and sacrament, and banish our fears with the comforting assurance of your abiding presence. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
First lesson is recorded in Acts chapter 13, beginning at the 12th verse. When Peter saw this, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Why are you staring at us? As if by our own power or godliness, we have made this man walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and disowned in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you. You killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. We are witnesses of this, and on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus that has strengthened this man whom you see and know. This faith that comes through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, just like your leaders. But in this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer. Therefore, repent and return to have your sins wiped out so that refreshing times may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus, the Christ, appointed for you. Here ends the reading. We sing together Psalm 16. second lesson is recorded in 1 John chapter 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the God who has given birth also loves one who has been born of him. This is how we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commands. In fact, this is love for God, that we keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, because everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? 
Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water alone, but by the water and by the blood. The Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. Here ends the reading. The Holy Gospel is recorded in St. John chapter 20, beginning at the 19th verse. On the evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were together behind locked doors because of their fear of the Jews. Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. Just as the Father has sent me, I am also sending you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whenever you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. Whenever you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. But Thomas, one of the twelve, the one called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples kept telling him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger into the mark of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. After eight days, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Take your hand and put it into my side. Do not continue to doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, because you have seen, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus, in the presence of his disciples, did many other miraculous signs that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of our Lord.
grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The word of God that we meditate on this morning is found in the gospel lesson from John, which you've already heard. Dear friends in Christ, there was a speaker who asked his audience to give a mental picture of what they thought of when they thought of the word peace. And he gave them a few moments, and after that, he asked different audience members who volunteered their answers, and they gave answers like, well, peace to me looks like being somewhere with beautiful flowers and beautiful trees. Another one gave an answer that said, oh, I envision snow-capped mountains and a beautiful landscape. Another one said, oh, I envision being around a beautiful lake, very still, very calm. After they all got done with their answers, there was one thing in common. None of them had people in them. And the speaker commented to that degree, too, and he said, isn't it interesting that when asked to imagine peace, the first thing that we do is to eliminate everyone else. On that evening of the first Easter, it was a little different than that. The disciples were all searching for peace. And as they searched for peace, they actually banded together. They weren't trying to eliminate each other from their lives, but rather they sought each other's companionship to get an understanding of the events that had just occurred. Let's just run down a little bit of what they had encountered early that morning or during that day already, because it did start very early with three women going to the tomb Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, headed to the tomb with thoughts that they were going to be embalming Jesus' body. They bought spices just the night before, after the Sabbath had ended. And on the way there, they talked among themselves and said, hey, we've got a problem when we get there. There's that big stone, remember? How are we going to get that out of there so that we can access Jesus' body? Of course, by the time they arrived, they found they didn't have to worry about that. The stone had already been removed from the entrance. And once Mary Magdalene saw that, she hightailed it back to, to go tell the disciples. The other two ladies, though, they went in and saw no Jesus. Fold, folded clothes, neatly folded grave clothes that Jesus had been wearing, and then also an angel. An angel that told them, he's not here, he's risen, just as he said. Well, then came Mary Magdalene getting that word back to Peter and John, who, who did come already to the tomb too, and when they got there, they went in and discovered the same things, or similar things, There's the neatly folded grave clothes and no Jesus. What to make of it? Peter wasn't sure. John believed that Jesus was alive, but didn't really understand why. Well, Mary Magdalene then returned to the tomb herself, and she encountered Jesus, just like her window portrays. A little bit later, the other women on their way back to town had encountered Jesus too. They, all the women then were able to see Jesus and even touch him as well. It was a little bit later then that Jesus encountered two of his disciples on the road to Emmaus. We often call them the Emmaus disciples. Cleopas was one of them. We don't know the name of the other disciple, but Jesus made it clear to them in the end who he was, and they finally did recognize him in the end, and why he had come. 
And so by evening, all these witnesses had gotten back to the disciples, had gotten back to their remaining 11 disciples. Can you imagine and can you see why they might have been confused? For the most part, they hadn't been anticipating Jesus' resurrection, even though Jesus had clearly told them, this is what we're going to do. And none of the 11, as far as we understand, had yet seen Jesus. On top of all that, They were a little afraid. Remember, the Jewish authorities got to Jesus and drove him to the cross. Maybe they were next. And besides, they understood that the rumor was out there. Oh, Jesus' disciples are probably going to parade Jesus' body and take it out of the tomb and say he's alive. So they knew that that had been out there too, as if they were doing something nefarious. So as they sat there or stood there huddled and confused, something remarkable happened. Jesus entered into the room. They weren't just seeing things, were they? It was really Jesus. This wasn't a ghost. This wasn't a spirit. It was him in the flesh, and he showed them the evidence, the wounds, right? Imagine how relieved they must have been. No wonder their hearts spilled out with joy, especially after they had heard that greeting, peace be with you. A very common greeting, to be sure, but now it took on new meaning. A living Jesus changed everything. It meant that Jesus accomplished exactly what he set out to do, and Jesus brought them and us. Peace. It's a peace that isn't temporary like our world knows. It's a peace that the world cannot give. It's a peace that goes beyond our understanding, a peace that sustains us through all of life's troubles. And the resurrected Christ is the one to reassure us of that peace. And there was one heart that was still troubled out there amongst the disciples. That was Thomas. Thomas wasn't present in that first encounter Jesus had with all of his disciples, and boy, did he miss out. The other disciples basically told him so. We saw Jesus in person. We saw him in the flesh. But no matter how hard they tried, We know that Thomas didn't buy it. He said, unless I see it for myself, unless I'm able to touch the very wounds of Jesus, then I'm not going to believe it. And so what did Jesus do? He came to the disciples a second time. And this time Thomas was there. And what did he do with Thomas at that time? Did he chastise Thomas for doubting? You tell him, oh, Thomas, you're stupid for not believing those other witnesses. No, he gave Thomas exactly what he asked for. The evidence, here's my hands, here's my side, go ahead, touch it. And of course, he did that after he greeted Thomas and the others with the same peace be with you. Jesus' words, Jesus' actions, all were meant to tell Thomas that in spite of his doubts, in spite of his unbelief, he was forgiven. His heart could be at peace. You know, in the end, Thomas does get a bad rap, doesn't he? After all, what does the world know him as? Downing Thomas, right? But think about that for a moment. Weren't the other disciples doing the same thing just earlier, just a week earlier? In spite of the eyewitness accounts they had received, weren't they still confused and in doubt 
of what really happened to Jesus, that Jesus was really alive? And what about us? Many of us were born and raised in the Christian faith. Many of us have known since childhood that Christ not only died but rose from the grave. How often do doubts raise, arise in our minds and hearts about God and about his intentions with us? Those doubts seem to rise up time and time again whenever there are problems in our lives. Can God really help me? Will God help me? One thing that this account of Thomas teaches us is the fact that it is impossible for us to believe in the resurrected Christ on our own. And so let's turn to God when those doubts arise. Listen to Jesus' comforting words once again. Peace be with you. See his hands, his side. He's alive. And he's risen for the express purpose of forgiving sins. And as such, he wants his followers to be in the business of forgiveness too. He said so in that first encounter, didn't he? What was the instruction that he gave to them and to us at that time? Receive the Holy Spirit. Whenever you forgive people's sins, they are forgiven. Whenever you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. There are many reasons that we need Christian community. And this is a big one, isn't it? So that forgiveness can be regularly announced. So that together we can receive the assurance that God still loves us in spite of the things that we do wrong. We receive that regularly when we come to worship, and we need to receive it regularly. What a, what a wonderful thing it is to receive it together, the assurance of Jesus' love and forgiveness. When you leave yourself on an island, how easy it is to doubt that God, what God does for you, that God still cares about you. And so may you regularly seek out Christian community provided here to be able to regularly receive the peace that sustains you to the end. And that brings us really back to where we began. When we envision peace, if we would have done the same exercise that that speaker had given, we might have had many of the same pictures, right? We might have envisioned a place alone, just a beautiful place that we consider beautiful for ourselves. But Jesus draws us to the reality that we need each other to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to each other. And we especially need to be in the presence of Christ. And we encounter Christ every time we listen to his word. In fact, that word is written so that we may have faith in the very peace that he provides. It's a peace that is offered every time we come to worship. And so here, Jesus, each time that you come here, hear him every time proclaim to you Peace be with you. Amen. Now may that peace which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's confess our faith according to the words of the Nicene Creed on page 13. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. 
for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please remain standing for prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, by the resurrection of your Son, you adopt all who believe in him. Receive us then as your newborn children and nourish our faith by the pure milk of your word that we may dwell in your presence forever. Almighty God, you have declared peace between God and man in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Receive our thanks for the authority given to your church on earth and grant that the ministers of your church would faithfully carry out their office and pronounce forgiveness of sins upon all repentant sinners. Heavenly Father, your peace flows from the risen and glorified wounds of Christ through your church and into the lives of all your faithful people. Bless and direct Christian parents that your forgiveness would be freely shared in their homes and that each family would live together in your peace. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that out of your indescribable grace and for the sake of your Son, you have given us the gospel and instituted the sacraments, that through them we may have comfort and the forgiveness of our sins. Grant us then your Holy Spirit that we may heartily believe your word and through the sacraments establish our faith day by day until at last we obtain eternal salvation. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He has raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms and placed all things under his feet for the benefit of the church. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever.
our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup and gave, gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Come, for all things are now ready.
Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Just be reminded that this Saturday there is a discussion, lecture, presentation on the new hymnal which is coming out. That's Saturday at 9 and there will be a joint voters meeting here on the budget Wednesday at 6. And then we just received before the start of the service an announcement from the Voyagers. They're going to be blasting off rockets, dads and sons. What a great thing to do. It's going to be at the Water of Life Lutheran Campus. That's the renamed New Hope on their Caledonia campus. This is for April 24th, but they wanted us to start announcing it now. It'll be in the papers. So that's rockets, engine, and wadding paper will be provided on launch day. So it sounds pretty cool. Have a great week. <laughs>